Welcome to the lecture of Professor Matt O'Donnell from, you know, Washington University in Seattle. And so Matt, you know, spanned uh, completely his uh, research yeah, career yeah, in the field of laser ultrasonics, biomedical imaging, photoacoustics, optoacoustics, and is still yeah, driving the research projects in this domain. So he has a huge experience and many achievements. Yeah? Uh, we discussed before the lecture with him, he started from general electrics. Yeah? And in general electrics, it was related to, you know, uh, ultrasonic imaging systems. Yeah. And later from general electrics, he was actually in many places he spent uh, and worked a lot. Yeah. I mean that from general electrics, it was the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor nearly for 10 years or even more with the huge achievements. And then he moved to University of Washington in Seattle, where he is working until now. Yeah. And his research is uh, like from ultrasonic imaging, moved more to photoacoustics and uh, optoacoustic imaging with different modalities. And as I understand, the most of the research is devoted, devoted to biomedical application. But of course, the part of the non-destructive testing is also present yeah, to, to some extent. Yeah? And so for his um, research achievements, he was awarded you know, many times with very prestigious prizes. Yeah? I would just mention the prizes from, you know, IEEE Society. So one is for the achievements and relay award, yeah, from UFFC, it's uh, ultrasonic frequency control, yeah? Yeah, ultrasonic and frequency control, IEEE Society, then award for excellence in biomedical technology, from IEEE EMBS Society and also IEEE Biomedical Engineering Award. And he is a fellow of IEEE AIMB, is an elected member of Washington State Academy of Science and the National Academy of Engineering. So this uh, somehow confirms, yeah, uh, let us say somehow officially, the huge achievements of, of Professor Matt O'Donnell. And so now we have a pleasure, yeah, that he will give for us a lecture. All right, Vitaly, thank you very much. Um, and it's a pleasure to be, I wish uh, I could be in Lamont if for no other reason than to go out to dinner with you all tonight at a, at a lovely place, because I know there are some there. Uh, many of them uh, there. And I also thank IEEE for allowing me to do these talks uh, uh, around the world in this way. All right, all right, Thomas, are you recording? I don't, I didn't see the message. Yes, I am. Okay, so let's get going. So let's get right into it uh, then. So what I wanna talk today about is ways in which we can bring light and sound together. So for photonics with ultrasonics, but I'm gonna do it using three different areas, three different ways in which you can combine light and sound. One is photoacoustics, of course, which is a, a dominant, uh, becoming a major modality now, but this is where light generates sound. Let me get my mouse over here. Okay, where light generates sound. The second is laser ultrasound, which of course is a, a key technology in your lab, uh, but this is where light is used to detect sound and to do that with no contact. And the final one is one that's a little different and uh, I think you'll find uh, interesting. And that is where we're gonna use light as the fundamental imaging uh, mechanism, but we're gonna use sound in an unusual way to modulate that light in order to get quantitative information about elastic moduli in soft tissue. Okay, first one, photoacoustics. Now, most of you know this, but I'll just give a one slide uh, introduction to the uh, photoacoustics principle. Considering the following uh, Gedanken thought experiment, 
let's say I have a medium, which is a highly scattering optical medium. And within it, I will embed a uh, absorber. In this case, it's just a simple uh, black bead, but an absorber, which will absorb at a specific wavelength. Now let's illuminate this object to probe it, which we do, but we illuminate it in a completely different way from traditional optical imaging. Optical imaging, the light is spatially compact, i.e. focused, but is temporarily continuous. It's a CW laser or even a tungsten lamp in a simple microscope. For photoacoustics, you do the exact opposite. You have something which is spatially extended, so light uh, illuminates this entire object and will scatter around in this object to hopefully get a sort of uh, uh, to get an approximately constant fluence. However, temporally, we will modulate it, and so the simplest way to do that is to make it a pulse. So it's temporally compact, spatially extended. When this light comes in and it bounces around in the medium, it's differentially absorbed at this site. That absorption creates an energy transfer into heat. The heating creates thermal expansion because it's time modulated that volumetric thermal expansion becomes a particle velocity. Particle velocity, of course, in acoustics is equivalent to a pressure. So a pressure wave can propagate out and be detected. And if you tune the timing of that pulse correctly, then the, acu the uh, acoustic waves that come out are in the megahertz range of ultrasound. So a conventional ultrasound detector can record those signals. The wave equation describing that is the left side, of course, is the wave equation in the pressure where C is the sound speed, not the uh, light speed. And the right is the drive term, which has some thermodynamic parameters, but then has this primary time derivative of the heating uh, uh, to give that. The signal you obtain as shown here which is actually a measured signal from many years ago of, of this Logodonkin experiment, is uh, that the timing of this waveform is acoustic. It's an acoustic wave. So it's in the megahertz range. So you can see uh, a cycle over 100 nanoseconds. So it's about five to 10 uh, megahertz signal. However, the peak height, the strength of that signal is proportional to how much light is absorbed. And so what you have is a signal which provides optical contrast. That is the strength of the signal is directly related to the light. And it is proportional to how much light gets to the object that is the fluence times the absorption coefficient, which is a fundamental material parameter, okay? The resolution though of any image we reconstruct from the acoustic waves is done at ultrasound. And this allows us reasonably large penetration depths of light into tissue because we do not have to maintain optical coherence to make these measurements. Now, what this does is allows us to bridge two worlds. This is a simple imagers or biomedical imagers plot, which shows the resolution of the imaging system versus the penetration depth into the body. We have two fields, uh, 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 well-developed fields of optical imaging, which creates micron to submicron resolution, but a penetration depth on the order of a millimeter versus ultrasound, which can have penetration depths at 10 centimeters and more, tens of centimeters into the body, but at resolutions which are millimeter down to around uh, 100 micron or so. What photoacoustic does is it allows us to span these two worlds. In one case, if we look down at uh, uh, finely focused uh, light at small penetration depths where the light is coherent, we can add to uh, conventional optical microscopy with photoacoustic microscopy. However, the second area is the area I've been most interested in because as uh, Vitaly said in the introduction, I'm primarily an ultrasound person. That's where my background uh, comes from. So we've looked at combining uh, photoacoustics with ultrasound into real time uh, imaging, which we have called PAUSE, photoacoustic ultrasound, so integrated PAUSE imaging. So that's the what, now the why. Why should ultrasound people be interested in bringing in this optical dimension into, uh, into the imaging? The reason is, is it allows us to go to the molecular scale. So what's been done in optics uh, for decades is using fluorophores and other uh, optical agents at the nanometer scale to provide contrast and specifically molecular contrast. What photoacoustics does is allow us to bring these optical tools into an ultrasound environment. And this is just a collection over the last, I don't know, uh, seven, eight years, up to 10 years now for some, 
of uh, contrast, molecular contrast agents designed uh, a couple of these in our lab and other labs uh, around the world. This is the promise uh, that you have, is to bring molecular uh, imaging into a traditional ultrasound scanner. <clears throat> I'll just show one image uh, of these types of agents. So this is work that comes from our lab uh, in the last year or so, which is a new agent, which is activated with simultaneous light and uh, uh, acoustic uh, excitation. And I won't go into the details of the agent. What I will tell you is that this agent can be uh, excited with uh, light levels, which are very low, well below a uh, millijoule per centimeter squared and acoustic pressures uh, with mechanical index well below one, such that we can, we can illuminate, we can uh, excite these agents at depths. As you see here, this is uh, over three, this is about three centimeters uh, inside a tissue is we can excite these, but these agents can be are at picomolar constant. We can go down to that low concentration. So true molecular imaging done with um, uh, these contrast agents, nanoscale contrast agents. So that's all I say about the motivation for photoacoustics. What I wanna focus on in the next 10 minutes or so is why hasn't photoacoustics has been around and as Vitaly and, and many on your team know is this field has been around for about 25 years and reactivated about 25 years ago. Yet we have really no major clinical uh, applications uh, of uh, photoacoustics, clinical trials, but no uh, uh, routine clinical applications. And we think that there are three primary reasons which are limiting the broad adoption of photoacoustics in the clinics. First of all, for this interleave, this integrated photoacoustic ultrasound systems, many uh, applications require truly real-time frame rates. And we're talking about frame rates which are above 50 Hertz, because that's what's needed for real-time uh, uh, real action as done in ultrasound. The second is, is that the ultrasound industry is moving towards very, very compact, portable, and low cost systems. And to do photoacoustics traditionally took a very, very uh, large and bulky uh, laser. And it's very hard to justify. So here, and this is now 10 years old, this picture, but this is the generation now of ultrasound scanners, these handheld things, which are the size of a cell phone, of, of a smartphone. This is the laser that was used to make that image on the previous slide. Now I'm doing this to be a little provocative. <clears throat> this is larger than what's needed. That's one unit Sharpie pen there. So that's the pump, the OPO, the control system, a cooling system underneath for this. You can make much more compact than this, but still nonetheless, traditionally, it's bulky, slow uh, lasers, which are really not compatible with this world of ultrasound. And finally, the optical delivery system must be seamlessly integrated with the probe. <clears throat> uh, so that you can do traditional handheld ultrasound scanning as is done routinely in the clinic. So our approach uh, to address those three major limitations is shown here, and it's to deliver light in a fundamentally different way than traditional photoacoustic imaging. In traditional photoacoustics, you have this large laser uh, that produces a, a high energy light pulse, which is then distributed to a set of fires and uh, fibers, and then broadly illuminates the object you're interested in. We, in contrast, have worked with a fast scanning approach where we take a much smaller compact laser that can work at very high repetition rates though. And then instead of delivering to all fibers at once, we deliver to one fiber per firing. So in each firing, we're delivering light to a single fiber and rapidly scanning this uh, across, the, um, across the imaging field. What does this do? What it does, first of all, is it changes this class of laser technology, these big, bulky, and slow lasers, to ones that look like this. This is a uh, diopalm solid state laser. It's uh, a YLF, so it works at uh, is the lazy material, so it's 1053. It works above a kilohertz PRF. We typically run it between one and 10 kilohertz PRF and has single digit uh, millijoule uh, energy. However, in our delivery system, the fluence at the tip of an individual fiber is the same for this system as it is for this system. Only here, we're delivering all the light only to one fiber at a time. What can you do with a system like that? Well, this is from a number of years ago now, but this is the simplest uh, example of how you can bring molecular imaging into ultrasound with that simple laser system. I'll just let this play as I describe what it is. We're, we're emulating, uh, mimicking, a drug delivery procedure. That is something where you bring in a needle and will deliver a drug. On the left is the traditional ultrasound only uh, uh, guidance, real-time guidance you use. 
On the right is a photo integrated pause image where the grayscale is ultrasound, the color image is photoacoustics. I'll now start the experiment and describe it. Okay, just as you do you, uh, uh, for deliver the drug, you bring in a needle, you can see it on ultrasound. You can also see it on photoacoustics because of course you can see the absorption, optical absorption in the metal. You'll now inject the contrast agent. It's a fluid, so you can't see it in ultrasound, but you can molecularly label it optically. And so we can now see, molecularly label the drug, so we now can see the drug. So we don't see anything here, but we see the drug. We can see the drugs distributed, how it's taken up by different tissues, and do this not just over minutes, but over hours to days later, since this is a pure molecular label. So I think you get the idea, this is why uh, of what we can do with, with this kind of fast uh, scan system. But that's a, a fairly simplistic approach because that's just getting a, a, a single wavelength uh, shot to get the full power of optics of molecular profiling, optical molecular profiling, is we need to be able to do spectroscopic imaging. And that means is we need to function in multi-wavelength. So in the next chain over the last few years, we have worked, collaborated with a, a, a vendor who's developed a uh, a, a tunable, a wavelength tunable uh, laser using this solid state laser as the, um, um, as the pump technology, but it's a Thai Sapphire electro optically tunable laser, which means from pulse to pulse to pulse at these high uh, repetition rates, we can arbitrarily pick a wavelength anywhere over about the 700 to 900 nanometer range. And again, single digit uh, millijoule energies it can deliver. This is just to note that we, in the, like I said, in the last couple of years, we have built a, a real-time system uh, for this. But what's interesting is that once we put this, uh, as we're putting this system together, we thought about two more limitations for specifically spectroscopic uh, photoacoustic imaging. We had the three big limitations in general for photoacoustic, but here was particularly is what's limiting spectroscopic approaches uh, inside the body. And we found we think there's two are the leading uh, uh, limitations. The first one is practical. The second one is fundamental. The practical one is that tissue moves. <clears throat> and if you're gonna make images over a rich set of wavelengths in order to um, uh, uh, characterize this optical absorption spectrum, that even at these fast frame rates that we go, there will be tissue motion, especially when you're looking at fast physiologic motion that will move the pixel around. And so when you look as a function of wavelengths, which are done at different times, you can corrupt the spectrum and therefore have uh, uh, improper molecular profiling. That's a practical issue, <coughs> uh, is practical. If you went fast enough, you wouldn't have to do it, but it's there and so uh, we need to address it. The second is a more fundamental issue. If you remember the photoacoustic signal is proportional to the amount of light that gets to the object times the fraction absorbed. That fractional absorption, the absorption coefficient is the fundamental material problem. That is what's done for molecular profiling. However, the photoacoustic signal is proportional to how much light gets there times that uh, uh, fundamental parameter. And the light that is delivered, especially as you're looking deeper and deeper, centimeters deep into the, the body, that light uh, uh, changes with wavelength as a result of the wavelength dependent diffusion coefficients of light uh, in tissue. If that is not accounted for, again, you'll get a coloring uh, of the spectrum and improper uh, molecular profiling uh, through it. So the uh, uh, wavelength dependent fluence um, uh, variations and tissue motion, one fundamental, one practical, or two issues that must be addressed for robust uh, spectroscopic photoacoustic imaging in the clinic. So our approach, our fast scan approach, which apply to uh, uh, spectroscopic imaging, allows us to attack both of these issues. First, because we can go so fast in our imaging, we interleave photoacoustic firings with ultrasound firings at very high rep rates. And with that, we can then reconstruct in real time collections of photoacoustic images at different wavelengths, but with corresponding ultrasound images, which are space and time registered. They're space registered because you use the same probe to get the information. They're time registered because of this interleaving of uh, uh, optical of laser and ultrasound firings. And so we can use the ultrasound images to do a very old uh, traditional technique developed in our lab many years ago, which is speckle tracking to track the motion 
that allows us to re-register these photoacoustic images and remove uh, this practical problem of uh, motion corruption of the images. So we have these now, these time and space aligned images at multiple wavelengths. The fundamental issue of laser fluence variations now, because we're scanning across different fibers, at any given firing of the laser, is we are in a different spatial position, which means that for any firing, it's a dip different optical path from the source to the absorbing object. If you have a common absorbing object, you'll get a curve like this, where if I just look at the fibers, I'll see they have a variation in the photoacoustic signal across there, even though it's the same absorber. So you have a common absorber, just a variable uh, uh, position of the light source. When I resort these fibers according to the distance from the source to the absorbing object, I'll get the fusion curves. I get these decay curves, which we can fit in real time and compensate for so that we can remove this fluent compensation. So in real time, we can correct for motion and we can compensate for wavelength dependence fluence variations. What's that allow you to do? Okay, so let's look at this. This is this drug mimicking experiment again, but now we're doing spectroscopically. So here you look in time, you see that we can sweep in real time uh, wavelengths and record the data. Okay, when we do that, after we've uh, uh, space and time registered the uh, photoacoustic images, which in this case, since there's no motion, since the tabletop experiment, that the, the, the um, motion compensation isn't important, but the fluence compensation is, and so that's been uh, done here, so that now when we look at an individual pixel, say in this area here, we can, for the different wavelengths at that one pixel, map out its optical absorption spectrum. Okay, and in this case, we can see that that spectrum closely matches to the spectrum of a nanoparticle, which we injected as a contrast agent. So we know that this pixel is dominated by the contrast agent. However, if we look at this other picture up in this area, which is where the needle alone is, is we see a completely different spectrum, which uh, corresponds to the needle spectrum. This is molecular profiling with optical spectroscopy. So what does that allow us to do in this imaging format is allows us to make projections of the, of the measured photoacoustic spectra onto the expected spectra of absorbers uh, in the image. In this case, which is the simplest example, we have two uh, uh, absorbers. One is the contrast agent and the second is the needle. So we can make images which separate those two. And that's shown here. So here's the sequence through this experiment. These are the conventional ultrasound, conventional photoacoustics. Here is the projection onto the contrast agent. So we see just the contrast agent image. Here is the projection onto the needle. And so we see just the needle image and it follows the experiment. When we stick the needle in, in the beginning, we see just the needle. When we inject the agent, we see agent plus needle. When we remove the needle, we just see the agent. True molecular imaging. Okay, and then finally, <clears throat> do this in vivo in an animal model. Again, sweeping through these uh, wavelengths rapidly, but here we have significant physiologic motion. And this just shows the motion correction. If I make these images, but I do not spatially register them, the photoacoustic image corresponding to the uh, 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 contrast agent is blurred, okay? And is uh, tremendously corrupted versus the couple of sites where we have injected the agent. However, when we do the uh, correction for motion, we now have almost a perfect projection onto the contrast agents. And so we get a clean image showing the primary sites where we have injected agent. True molecular imaging using very simple laser systems in, embedded within a real-time uh, ultrasound. Okay, that's the first part as we focus on. We'll now go to the second. The second is where light is used to detect sound. And this is something you all are very familiar with because uh, I'll use the rubric of laser ultrasound here uh, 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 to introduce this. And then laser ultrasound is we use the photoacoustic principle, but here, Photoacoustic is done where the light does not penetrate the object, but simply uh, illuminates the surface of an object where it is completely absorbed within micron scale uh, uh, thickness at the surface, which then efficiently launches a ultrasound wave perpendicular, longitudinal ultrasound wave perpendicular uh, to the surface. Then you have reflections from heterogeneities within the material, ultrasound, uh, so mechanical heterogeneities, reflect back to the surface. But now you want to detect that wave with no contact. And that's done optically, non-contact optical uh, detection. And this was called laser ultrasound for doing non-contact uh, ultrasound inspection uh, of components. 
So we originally got into this for non-destructive testing, not for biomedical, but I'm a biomedical guy. So you'll see at the end of this section how we have uh, used this to address, uh, use these technologies to address some uh, 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 significant issues uh, in biomedicine. But the core of it all is the interferometric detection. And so I don't have time to go through this in detail, so, uh, but I'd love to talk about this at the end if there's uh, uh, questions, because this is something we have developed. Uh, my uh, compatriot, Vanya Pelovanov, I and another person named Tak Buma, who was one of my former uh, postdocs, uh, developed this technology over a long time, but now has this tuned to a very, very sensitive and robust uh, detector. The idea is to, to do interferometric detection uh, of ultrasound, but to do it with no reference arm. Okay, so it's not a Michelson, not a Fabry Perot, it's something that's a Sanyak, and integrated optics and polarization maintaining fibers has allowed this to be implemented in a very efficient and robust way. The principle is, well, how can you do interferometry without a reference? Well, you do have a reference, but the reference is not a separate optical path, it's done by time delay. So you have a broadband a light source, which launches uh, uh, wave packets. You then can, through using polarization tricks, split this into two wave packets. So there's, these are coherent packets, but they're split now into two optical paths, one with a delay, so that when you come to the uh, uh, delivery system to the surface, you have two wave packets which are delayed by a fixed amount, typically on the order of 10 or 20 nanoseconds to the surface. Both of these reflect off the surface. When they come back, you switch paths such that they're now time aligned. And we, then we do a differential detection. So we call this a double differential because we have a differential detection and we have a differential measurement because it's a time uh, uh, reference. So it's a time derivative measurement uh, of the vibrations of that surface. What this does is two things. Number one, it makes it very robust because you don't have to stabilize a reference arm. The same uh, optical path is used both for reference and signal. And the second is, is you get 100% light modulation. So if you have a rough uh, uh, surface, a highly speckling uh, surface, the reference beam and the signal beam have the same speckling. So when they interfere, you have 100% uh, efficiency. So it's very, very robust and very uh, efficient. So what is our motivation to get into this? Well, this is uh, uh, what you see. Yes, you just saw a truck drive into the fuselage of that aircraft. And after you watch this, it's actually funny because you'll see that the driver runs away and they change. So somebody who was driving the truck shouldn't have been driving the truck. And that's why they ran it right into this uh, uh, aircraft. And you laugh a little bit, but we found out from our friends at Boeing, because Boeing uh, uh, commercial aircraft is headquartered in Seattle, that this happens on average once per year for every aircraft in the worldwide fleet. Now, not that a truck runs away, but, but some kind of vehicle impact, lightning strike, bird strikes in either landing or uh, uh, a significant you know, bird flock uh, when you're either landing or taking off. And the issue is, is that for metal aircraft, it's very clear what to do because you can look at visual, you can visually inspect the surface and there's a very strong correlation between the visual surface damage <clears throat> and the volumetric damage that you have to the aircraft. But for composite materials, that's not true. And so we were looking at a way and talked to our uh, Boeing friends where we, if there was an accident like this, you could bring out a robot of some sort, which in a non-contact way could rapidly scan this area of a composite material and see if, what the level of impact damage uh, there is throughout the volume. So that was our motivation. So we got into this, which is interesting because I, I, my wife and I always joke about this. We're working with the aerospace companies. And what I know about aerospace is the choice between a window seat and an aisle seat. I know nothing about aerospace, the first principle. But it was interesting interacting with these people to bring this technology uh, uh, to them. And so it's a laser ultrasound rubric. So again, you guys mostly know this pretty well. But uh, the idea is if for every one firing of our pump laser, with continuous recording of the uh, received ultrasound signal, we get one line of information through the uh, material. And that's an A scan like we have here. So that's a pulse echo ultrasound recording with non-contact detection uh, through the material. If we now optically scan uh, uh, the source and detection beams very, very rapidly along the line, we can get a cross-sectional image such as this of one of these composite, these laminated composite materials showing the basic structure as well as some defects. What I'll show you subsequently 
is we spatially filter these, these uh, raw images to remove the periodic structure and just look for flaws. So you see images which look very clean other than where there are uh, flaws. Finally, we can raster scan uh, the entire source and detector beams uh, over surface, get three-dimensional data. But the way we'll present this, at least for a biomedical person, is a little unusual. We'll present these as what are called C-scan images. And that is we'll show slices, uh, horizontal cross sections through the material, but we show these as a movie, where in the movie, time is running. Uh, as time runs on, you're going from the top surface of the material to the bottom surface. So with time, you're going through depth. So it's like you're peeling away uh, layers of the material by looking through uh, the movie. <clears throat> so here's the test, a simple test that, that demonstrated the power of this approach. Okay, so here's a composite uh, uh, component that we got from our friends at uh, Boeing. We drop a ball bearing on it according to their specifications and you can see just a little dimpling uh, of the surface. We then scan this area shown in the blue uh, here in a few minutes with our rapid uh, laser ultrasound scanner. We then took the material, sectioned it, brought it to the medical center and did high resolution micro uh, CT on this, section, on this section, which took many hours and actually cost a few thousand dollars because we had to uh, rent uh, the facility uh, to do this. We re-rendered the images so they're in the same uh, format as the C scans and then compared the state of the art in destructive testing of these materials to this very cheap, rapid, uh, uh, compact laser uh, ultrasound system. So we'll play the movie and you can look through. So now you can see these propeller effects, which we see both on the CT and on the laser ultrasound. And here in the laser ultrasound, we start, we, at the bottom, we let all of these integrate together because you get uh, reverberations of the sound. And so you can see the entire volume of the damage, huge volume of damage for that little surface defect. Now I think you see the power of this and that's why the Boeing folks were so excited. We're trying, we now have this uh, system uh, mounted uh, on a robot uh, within Boeing uh, for their internal R&D and hopefully get into production line soon. And we're also looking at some field uh, applications as well. And my goal is to get one of these things on a drone. So the drone can fly around and do this. Every time I say that, Vanya gives me a dirty look because he thinks about the vibrations. But our, our uh, interferometer is amazingly stable uh, under to a lot of mechanical shocks. So I think it, it could be possible. Okay, I'm a biomedical guy. So as soon as we started doing this stuff, I immediately started thinking about where are their applications uh, in biomedicine for this non-contact optical detection. And we've looked at three. One is in label-free flow cytometry, that is, is uh, uh, single cell uh, identifications and characterization. Photoacoustic histology, this is point of care histology, which is done for molecular and digital pathology. But the one I'll show you, just for example, is for scatter-free spectrophotometry. Okay, and so what is spectrophotometry, uh, first of all, and why should we care? Spectrophotometry is the gold standard. If you go into any biochemical lab, any bioengineering lab, you will find usually off in the corner, something called a UV vis, UV hyphen VIS or UV visible light spectrophotometer, which is used for molecular profiling of solutions and of tissue homogenates. Okay, and it's based on this optical absorption spectra, which we learned about back in photoacoustics. So this is where this molecular profiling idea got started was in spectrophotometry. So let's consider a simple experiment here to, to explain it. Consider that you want to look and profile these little nanoparticles in a solution. So you have a light source and a detector and you do a simple substitution measurement. That's what spectrophotometry is. You measure the light from source to detector without the solution in there. You put in the solution, you measure how much light is lost. That gives you the absorption. And from that you sweep the wavelength. And so you can get the spectra, the optical absorption spectra, which is directly related to the molecular characteristics of those contrast agents. However, spectrophotometry fails in a lot of important cases of interest and is uh, where you can have high optical scattering as well. And here's a case uh, which I'll use as the example to show the power of doing uh, 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 spe spectrophotometry a different way. <clears throat> and that is if you wanna look at these same nanoparticles, but you wanna do it in cell culture 
and see how those nanoparticles are trafficking through individual cells. Once the nanoparticles are integrated with the cells, this is a very complex optical environment which can scatter light out. And so you will get simple substitute, optical substitution measurements, which are nonsense, which don't tell you uh, anything about there. Now there are optical means with something called like um, integrating spheres and other uh, 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 techniques, which need strong calibrations and are really just laboratory uh, instruments that can overcome this. We wanted to look at a simple way to, over, uh, to be able to make spectroscopic measurements in environments, uh, complex optical environments like this using photoacoustics but using photoacoustics <clears throat> with non-contact detection of ultrasound. And so this is the system we've built. And that is, it's a photoacoustic system, but it has no ultrasound transducer. And the idea is we're doing that so that we can look at cells in cell culture within conventional um, multi-well plates. So you have cells culturing in these different wells, you'll bring in light, but now you'll bring in two light sources. One light source, like in traditional photoacoustics, is the uh, excitation beam, which now goes into the cells and it will excite whatever absorbers there are in the cell culture. But then the acoustics, which is created now, that back propagates uh, to the bottom well, to the bottom plate of the well, we uh, use our interferometric detection to record the vibrations of that bottom well and get the ultrasound signal uh, from that. So, so it's just totally non-contact photoacoustic spectroscopic measurements within uh, these cell cultures. What can you do with it? Well, let's go back to this, this example of nanoparticle trafficking in cells. So we're looking at a specific case of HUVEC cells. Okay, these are end, um, uh, endothelial cells that come from the human uh, umbilical vein. And we picked these cells because they rapidly can endocytose uh, a wide class of nanoparticles. So this is just an example system. We then <clears throat> bring in the nanoparticles, in this case, simple gold nanorods, and look uh, at the optical spectra that we can measure. So first we do this <clears throat> when we just introduce the nanoparticles into solution. So you have separated cells and nanoparticles. We make a substitution measurement between the total solution and one with just cells, but no nanoparticles. When we do the, the substitution measurements, we get a nice uh, reasonable spectrum. It looks like the nanoparticles. And you would say, and then underneath it, we have the measurements we made with this non-contact photoacoustic system. And they're very, very similar. So you should be looking at me now and saying, Matt, why, why do you do this? I mean, you said you get in trouble, yet you just showed the photoacoustic and the simple substitution measurements look the same. Yeah, that's in the simple case. What happens now when these nanoparticles start to traffic? And in particular, what happens where the vast majority of the nanoparticles have been captured inside cells and are at high densities inside the cells, this very strong optical environment. When I make the optical substitution measurement, I get garbage, this spectra here. However, the photoacoustic spectrum is very interesting. And let's look at that in more detail. So here's this non-contact photoacoustic measurement. This is the garbage UV vis measurement. Here is the spectrum we get <clears throat> for when the nanoparticles are outside the cells. This is the spectrum we get when the nanoparticles are inside the cells. And this is a very real physical uh, effect is that when they're inside cells, these uh, nanoparticles are captures and is only captured. So they're very closely packed. And so you can get coupling, plasmonic coupling between the nano rods, that's why we picked rods, which can couple this way or this way. And those two different modes split. One provides a red shift, one a blue shift. So by measuring the spectrum, we can differentiate between nanoparticles which have been captured inside the cells versus those outside cells. So again, true molecular profiling, but now done in this non-contact way, non-contact um, uh, uh, optical detection of ultrasound. Okay, let's go to the last one. We'll do in about 15 to 20 minutes. That'll be good. We'll probably finish right at the top of the hour. So uh, optical coherence elastography, and this is where, as opposed to what we've done before, where the primary mechanism for imaging was sound, the primary mechanism now will be light. So light is the imaging, but we're going to use sound in an unusual way to modulate the light. And the example here is an area called optical coherence elastography. The imaging is done with OCT, optical coherence tomography, which is the dominant imaging modality now for looking at the posterior segment of the eye, primarily the retina. Okay. 
We're going to add to that ultrasound in an unusual way <clears throat> to modulate the system such that we can use OCT to quantitatively measure uh, information about the elastic moduli of soft tissue. Okay. But we're going to do this in not only to, to uh, quantitatively analyze the um, elastic moduli, but also to do it without contact. And the reason we've approached this is because there are three uh, biomedical applications which really motivated uh, this work to begin with, where non-contact measurement of uh, uh, elastic properties is paramount. The first is in the eye, in the cornea, specifically where you can have advanced diseases like advanced keratoconus, you have failed refractive surgeries, or just normal uh, uh, corneas, or when people are doing treatment planning for procedures such as um, uh, LASIK uh, surgeries, is you want non-contact characterization of elastic band. We'll talk about that in, in a little bit of detail in a few minutes. The second application is skin. And in the skin, what we're particularly looking at are skin transplants. That is, uh, in the United States alone, there are tens of millions, yes, tens of millions, tens of 10 to the six procedures for skin grafts. And it's used for burns, which is the obvious one, but also for reconstructive surgeries, for plastic surgeries. But what's done right now is, is that it's the uh, matching of donor skin to recipient skin is done mostly by experience. The elastic properties of the skin are not tried to be matched in any way other than by experience. And we provide a quantitative tool which allows us to identify the appropriate skin uh, to transplant and then monitors the transplant procedure and the recovery to, to ensure that the skin return, uh, 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 the graft provides the elastic properties that are needed for a successful graft. Okay, and again, non-contact is important, especially for skin and reconstructive surgery patients. And finally, small delicate samples. This is something I'll not talk about, but I'm, I'm really personally most interested in this idea of organ on a chip, and that is evolving cell culture systems uh, on, on devices, which are used to min mimic organ functions. And this is a way to monitor the evolution, longitudinally monitor the evolution of elastic properties uh, in those cultures. Okay, I'll focus primarily the rest of this on the cornea, although I'll show one example uh, from the skin. So let's do as a good bioengineers is uh, to talk about the motive, biomedical motivation for trying to make non-contact detection of uh, elastic properties in the cornea, so the anterior segment of the eye. So what is the cornea? Well, the cornea, of course, is the primary focusing lens of the human uh, visual system. Its shape, since it's a nearly constant optical index of refraction, its shape determines its uh, focal characteristics. And its shape is driven by, it is deformed under the action of the intraocular pressure, but then the curvature uh, under that forcing function, the curvature that it produces is determined by two things. Number one is the thickness, i.e. the geometry uh, of the cornea. And the second is by the elastic properties, okay? So that is, uh, so elastic properties are directly linked to shape, which is directly linked to the performance, the optical performance of that lens. The clinical standard of care is to measure the shape optically and to try to estimate the IOP using a force deformation a measurement, which assumes characteristics about uh, uh, the mechanical, the uh, elastic moduli uh, of the cornea. The elastic moduli are not measured and therefore that can both confound IOP measurements and also not allow you to predict shape changes as a result of therapeutic interventions. So our clinical goals were to quantitatively map the elastic modulus with no contact, to use those measurements of uh, corneal elasticity to measure the interocular present independent of uh, any assumptions of corneal elasticity, and ultimately to use that information to guide and optimize therapeutic interventions because we're able to predict shape of uh, uh, cornea as a result of particular interventions having an appropriate biomechanical model, okay? In the remainder of this time, <clears throat> I'll just focus on talking about how we measure and quantitatively map uh, the elastic modulus. To do that, to map the elastic modulus, there are three pieces uh, we must do. Uh, first is we need non-contact, for non-contact uh, um, uh, probing of the elastic properties. First of all, we need non-contact imaging. The second is it must be quantitative, okay? So we can't just say is it harder or softer or something like that, which is often done in conventional elastography uh, in biomedicine. We have to be quantitative. We have to talk about the elastic moduli in kilopascal, megapascal, whatever. And finally, the hardest part in the beginning was we have to do these deformations 
uh, with no contact. Okay, how do we do non-contact imaging? That was easy. Two labs down from us in our department is one of the world's experts in phase sensitive uh, optical coherence tomography. Ru Kong Wan, Ricky Wong is there. And so we talked to him about leveraging his systems, which are real time 4D, so real time three dimensional uh, imaging systems, uh, optical systems that have resolutions in the microns, typically 10 to 20 micron scale uh, optical resolution, but they're sensitive to displacements, which are in the order of a nanometer or less. So very, very highly sensitive uh, systems for, for looking at displacements, deformations. Second, quantitation. Our approach to quantitation is to use dynamic elastography. And the idea is, is you will launch a mechanical wave and track propagation of that mechanical wave with your real-time imaging system. In the simplest case, if you can launch a bulk shear wave into the uh, soft tissue, and then use the imaging system to track that, then locally you can estimate the wave speed of that wave. The wave speed is simply uh, proportional to the square root of the shear modulus, that's just material density, which is a, a pretty constant in soft tissue. So that modulus, the shear modulus is proportional to the wave speed squared. And in an uh, uh, incompressible or nearly incompressible isotropic uh, medium, which much of soft tissue is, the uh, shear modulus is simply proportional. This proportionality factor is a constant of three to the Young's modulus, and the Young's modulus defines tension, response to tension. So this is the shape. So the Young's modulus will uh, primarily determine the shape as a result of IOP. So by measuring these wave speeds through these simple formulas, you can get to the modulus which determines shape. That's the principle, and you'll see it's much more complicated than that, though. Okay, finally, how we do the deformations uh, uh, with no contact. Well, for contact, we know there's many ways. You can have vibrators, static compressors, and ultrasound radiation force, which is the core of ultrasound elastography, where a transducer is coupled into the eye, uh, and then as ultrasound waves propagate into the eye, they lose energy, they're absorbed, and that transfer of energy is momentum transfer, which uh, can launch a mechanical wave. Of course, though, that requires contact. For non-contact, there's the clinical tool called an air puff, which literally is that, is a, a puff of air. It's very coarse and crude, so it does not produce high enough frequency mechanical waves that you can do uh, robust imaging. We looked at using photoacoustics because that's we know how to do that. So we looked at pulsed UV light that worked to launch waves, but was very inefficient and was going to probably be a safety risk if you tried to transfer it clinically. So we decided, well, we still, this ultrasound radiation force is a way to go, but we can't couple, we can't uh, contact uh, the eye, but can we still use it? Well, a bright postdoc at a group meeting once said, well, why don't we just bring in the ultrasound through air? After laughing at him a little bit, we realized actually <laughs> it was a brilliant idea because if you could launch ultrasound in air, it's perfectly reflected at the boundary of the cornea because of the high acoustic impedance mismatch. That's a 100% momentum transfer to that surface, which can launch uh, very efficiently launch a transient wave. These are the fingers of that bright postdoc, who's now a faculty member in, in um, uh, Krakow in Poland. And just showing that if you can launch ultrasound through the air, you can have significant radiation pressure. Here he's just moving some salt around uh, on the platen. And so uh, this, is, uh, this was done at 400 kilohertz. But based on these initial thoughts and ideas, we then did some significant modeling and design and built a family of air coupled ultrasound transits. So we launch ultrasound through air. Yes, through air. What I will show you are measurements which are made at one megahertz with a cylindrically uh, focused uh, lens here, acoustic lens, which creates a line source. That reflection from there creates a little tapper, hammering which we call micro tapping because the line source is about 300 microns uh, in, in width that launches broadband, uh, very efficient, uh, uh, efficiently launches broadband mechanical waves, which can prop, propagate into the material and we can then image uh, with the real time OCT. This is just a simulation, but shows what happens if we hit right here into a, a conventional soft material such as tissue, we'll launch two waves. One is a surface wave uh, along here, a Rayleigh wave. The second is a bulk shear wave coming off at a fixed angle, pretty much a constant angle for all soft uh, tissue. 
as we expect, this relation between the el shear elastic modulus and the wave speed square is a little fudge factor for the surface wave, but nonetheless, it very closely matches that simple idea for quantitation. So how do we make wave speed images? Well, we can look at uh, uh, wave propagation. So if I just look along the surface and make an XT plot, this is the position along the surface, this is time, we can see that surface wave propagating. And so if we take local derivatives, we can get local estimates of the wave speed. So that's what we did. So we put a system together, which has the real-time uh, 4D OCT system integrated with our uh, air-coupled ultrasound uh, a transducer, rather. We then uh, you know, synchronize this entire system in a, a little imaging system, and it makes pictures like this. So this on the uh, shear, the grayscale is optical. This is an OCT, three-dimensional OCT image of the cornea. You can see this little black spot in the middle is a specular reflection artifact at the apex of the cornea. The colors going across here are the mechanical waves, which have long with the micro tapping. And in real time, we are propagating. Now, this is a slow speed shown here. It's much faster in real life, this. And we're comparing in a pig model, the wave propagation when we hold that pig at 10 millimeters of mercury as the interactive pressure, which is a normal pressure, versus a highly elevated pressure of 40 millimeters of mercury here. And as you can see, the waves travel much faster in the higher pressure system. We can track these, uh, so we have these uh, wave fields in 4D. So in all three uh, uh, dimensions, so it's all voxels within this three dimensional grid, as well as all time points over the experiment. We can then reconstruct the wave speed. So we reconstruct the wave speed and compare it between the two interocular pressures. We see a much lower wave speed at the low pressure versus the high, and this is very uh, understandable because soft uh, tissue, such as especially collagenous tissue, such as the cornea, is very nonlinear uh, acoustically. Um, uh, so the shear wave uh, or the, the mechanical wave speeds will change quite a bit depending on the pressure, and this was demonstrating this. So very cool. We then did this in the skin, and you can look here, uh, just contrasting something in the palm versus the wrist. Okay, here's the palm with the Langer's lines and the wrist. You can see much faster wave speeds in the palm than the wrist uh, uh, due to the elastic characteristics. And so now we have these structural OCT images, which we can match with these uh, OCE images. We see this uh, faster speed, so these are higher moduli in the um, uh, palm sites versus this. So looks great. Looks like very simple, straightforward way. So wait a minute, you guys are really good scientists and engineers. Is it really this easy? And the answer is no. So in the next five minutes, I'll show you how you to get to true quantitation, what does it take? Okay, well, there are uh, lots of complications and I'm a native New Yorker. So we would always say this is problems, problems, problems. We have problems. The two, which are the most important and most significant, which I'll deal with in these last few minutes is guided wave behavior and tissue anisotropy. Okay, so first of all is guided waves. We have assumed in all this simple analysis of wave speeds to elastic moduli that the media is semi-infinite. However, the cornea is very thin. It's a bounded material and its thickness is, con even with the broad range of frequencies we use in our mechanical waves, <clears throat> the mechanical waves, their wavelengths are comparable to the thickness we have here. So that means we're gonna have some level of guiding. So if you had this bulk material, we had these two simple waveforms like this and simple wave field plots to look at local wave speeds. However, in a bounded material, we now have reflections from both surfaces that can occur. And so doing greatly complicates these wave fields. So if you look at local derivatives, it has nothing to do with uh, bulk characteristics. Therefore, with um, a moduli, a tissue moduli, the geometry influences that. However, we know from physical acoustics, from uh, geophysics, from other areas of looking at mechanical wave propagation and layers, that we can do spectral analysis of these waveforms. And from that, get dispersion relations and their well-defined modes. And when we do that and plot them in a more characteristic um, uh, format uh, for dispersion analysis, where we're looking at the propagation wave speed as a function of frequency, we get these characteristic modes, A0 mode, the S0, so the anti-symmetric and symmetric modes, and higher order modes. If you can uh, measure these, though, over a wide range of frequencies, as we can with our microtapping experiments, 
we can then fit to one of these modes as we do here in an A0 mode. And from that, estimate the high frequency asymptote, which is the bulk characteristic. So with dispersion analysis, we can get these bulk characteristics. So remember dispersion analysis. Okay, second anisotropy. The mechanical properties of soft tissue are characterized destructively. So you take a piece of tissue, you bring it into the lab using two techniques. One is a tensile test, which is a simple force deformation, uh, which directly measures uh, the Young's modulus. When you do that for uh, a cornea, taken ex vivo, that's for outside the body, is you find in the human, it's in the order of megapascals. Think three megapascals is a number, a typical number, okay? The second kind of test, which is done destructively, is to do shearing, direct shearing tests, which is rheometry or torsion, rotational force. And this is a direct measure of the shear modulus mu. And when you do that in uh, uh, coordinate, you find this in the tens of megapascals. So think around 30 kilopascals. So three uh, megapascals for E and 30 kilopascals, 25, 30 kilopascals uh, for mu. So is the cornea isotropic? Well, if it is, then E equals three mu in a uh, 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 incompressible or nearly incompressible material. Cornea E is about three megapascals, mu is about 25, three times 25 is 75, over an order and a half magnitude difference. Clearly the um, cornea is not isotropic. Last two minutes. So is the cornea isotropic? No. The cornea though is, it's reasonable it's, not, it's anisotropic because it's lamellar sheets of collagen. So similar to those composite materials we saw in the non-destructive testing area, these are sheets, but these are as a sheets of carbon fibers, these are sheets of collagen uh, fibers, which are you, uh, uh, arbitrary in plane, but you have different planes, they're lamellae. So the simple uh, mechanical uh, stiffness matrix for an isotropic material must change now to one in which we have two shear moduli, but we don't change the longitudinal terms because this is for a nearly incompressible material. So we focus on these two. The reason is because for an incompressible material that one of these, the mu, simply determines the Young's modulus and does have this fixed constant of three, but the shearing, in plane shearing characteristics are now determined by G. <clears throat> so we thought we have, we've decoupled mu from G, we can find the information. However, when we now do this micro tapping experiment and launch in the material and look at the typical waves, the polarization of the uh, uh, transversely propagating waves that we look at, we see that the wave speed is directly related to just the G parameter. That's bad because G does not determine tension, tension determines shape. And so there's no relation, or, or there's minimal relation between those wave speeds and predictions of how shape will change due to an intervention. Okay, so it's not there. However, for the first time in my life is a bug became a feature because the cornea is not a bounded material. It is a bounded material, it's not infinite. It means that you can have coupling between the different polarizations of shear wave due to the reflections off the boundaries. And so in that case, the lowest order uh, mode, the A0 mode couples polarizations and therefore couples information about the two uh, moduli. So when you do that, you'll find just to go through is that the, uh, the mode structure changes based on the uh, anisotropy factor. The low frequency end is determined primarily by mu, the high frequency end determined by G. So when you fit, you can simultaneously estimate both mu and G. And that's what we've done. We look at a, a isotropic phantom and we get the characteristic fits as we would expect. When we look in the cornea, we get this lower order mode where the, where the isotropic model is a terrible fit but our nitty model giving us both parameters is a perfect fit. And so for that, we're able to estimate simultaneously the shear modulus G and the Young's modulus E. The Young's modulus is in this megapascal range. This uh, shear modulus is in the uh, tens of kilopascal range. And we can measure this over the IOP and get the nonlinear characteristics. So for the first time, we can use wave field measurements, non-contact wave field measurements to get uh, uh, the elastic moduli, which can be used to predict shape, which is the fundamental property needed for clinical interventions. So in this uh, time, I've tried to, uh, well, I have talked to you about three areas in which we can bring light and sound together to do some interesting things in photoacoustics, laser ultrasound, and finally in optical coherence elastography. 
So I want to acknowledge the funding sources who provided funds for us to do this work. My faculty colleagues, uh, which I show here, uh, last generation of postdocs that have been uh, in the lab. And finally, I'll say thank you. Thank you for inviting me and happy to uh, uh, take questions and talk for as long as you'd like. Thanks very much. And we'll quit there.